The main scripture this morning is from Ephesians 6, the verse that I read. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against human beings made of flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of the world, the prince of this world, Satan, that is our enemy. And whether we acknowledge these unseen powers or whether we do not acknowledge them, whether we call them our enemies or think it's just some myth of the Bible, I want to tell you, whether you or I recognize it or not, there's one thing sure. They're your enemy, whether you're against them or not. Jesus said, I am come to give life, and that much more abundantly. But he says, the devil is a thief and a robber, and he is out to steal, to rob and to kill and to destroy. He will steal from you your character. He will steal from you your will. He will steal from you your personality. He will destroy your talents. His whole work is hatred against God and God's creation. For you and I were made in the image of God. Our enemy is not our brother in the church. However despitefully they may use us. Or however wrongly they may do things against us. They're not our enemy. Our enemy is not some atheistic philosophy or government that would put us in prison and torture us and kill us. That, they're not our enemies. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Let me give you one or two scriptural examples of this truth. How Jesus recognized this from the very beginning of his ministry. For Satan was his enemy. And without going into the temptation just before his ministry started, the Bible clearly states that it was the devil that tempted him. He knew his enemy and he knew how to deal with it. He chose twelve apostles. Christ had come the light of the world and he chose 12 men that would carry on the message that he brought to the world when he had been crucified, risen and ascended into heaven. He left this responsible charge with these apostles and he chose them after praying all night. They walked with Christ daily for about three years they were eyewitnesses of the most tremendous, powerful life that has ever been seen on the earth. They heard the most marvelous teaching and truth that any man had ever spoke. They had lived in close, intimate fellowship with God himself on earth in the form of human flesh. They were greatly privileged and they were chosen to be witnesses of the Son of God. It is a staggering fact to realize that though they walked with him, saw his miracles, heard his words, yet it took quite a long while before they realized he was the Son of God. And one day, well into the ministry of Christ, he said, Who do men say that I am, the Son of Man am? They said, some say Elias, some say Jeremiah, some say one of the prophets. And then Christ said to those apostles, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're blessed, Simon. Flesh and blood 
did not reveal that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So Peter had the revelation now. This was not only a good man, not only a prophet, not only one who could do miracles and speak wonderful words, but this was God himself revealed in the flesh to mankind, the promised Messiah. Despite all that, Peter with a sincere heart and with integrity and thinking he was doing Christ a service, when Christ started to say to his apostles, the time is drawing near for me to go to the cross and be crucified and to die and to be raised the third day. And Peter, in all sincerity, thinking he was doing good, in his human knowledge, he said, forbid it ever, Lord. You, you're not going to do that. He actually rebuked Christ. He actually tried to correct Christ. Now we could judge Peter. Peter had not yet realized the subtle, the cunning way that evil powers can put a thought or a feeling into the heart that almost looks as if it's for God. And none of us are immune from that. You wonder why I stress joy, but how I even stress more soberness. When I was in battle and bullets were flying and shells were falling and men were being blown to bits at my side, I tell you I was very sober. We wrestle not against flesh and blood who can send bombs and shells and atom bombs. They are very insignificant in, in comparison. We fight are the one who can send us to hell and destroy body and mind and soul and bring us in torment forever. Now Jesus, because he was God, when he heard that, just as he recognized when Peter had revelation and he said, Blessed art thou, Peter. He turned now when Peter says, No, forbid it that you should go to the cross. Jesus turned. That's not Peter. Peter doesn't know what he's saying. The cross is the very reason I've come. The cross is what all the prophets have prophesied. The cross is the only way the world can be saved. Peter doesn't know what he's saying. He's got to be a witness for me. He loves me. He doesn't talk to Peter. He turns and in both accounts, in Matthew and in Luke, he turns and he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus spoke not to Peter, but he spoke to that power behind that was caused, that was the instigator of this. He didn't judge Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Then he brought that marvelous word, Thou savorest the things that be of men. For all flesh and blood outside of Christ is in the hands of the prince of this world. And if you are not in God's kingdom, you are a captive of Satan, whether you know it or not. He takes them captive at his will. You and I think that we are the master of our lives and we can choose what we do and we have willpower over this and, and that. We have no power at all except for what God's grace will give us. That power is far more powerful than we are and it's a man who's the worst fool in the world if he doesn't recognize there's an evil power. It's evident to your eyes. All over the world. Don't tell me, men, that are doing the things they do. Don't tell me that that's just natural. It's satanic. Thank God we know it. We've got to realize this. If we're going to grow as a church and if we're going to keep in unity and if we're not going to have division in our ranks we must realize our enemy is not our brother and sister. It's the devil behind. We must love our brother. Judge not. Christ didn't judge Peter. Do you know what he said to him? He says, Peter, Satan has desired to have thee and to sift thee as wheat. God is allowing Satan to deceive you and test you. But fear not, I have prayed for you. 
And when you're converted, when you realize what your real enemy is, then I'll use you. It's a wonderful story, Peter. They judge him for his denial. Be very careful. Christ didn't. He just turned and looked at Peter. And it says Peter went out and wept. Because just the look of Christ was enough to dispel the deceptions of Satan. The love of God overwhelmed his fears. And he became a man that wept. That he denied his very saviour. Don't judge your brother. Don't judge your sister. Remember, it's the devil behind them. Does that not make it easier to forgive? Now, that does not say that we've got to excuse their weaknesses. Oh, no, not at all. We can rebuke our brother. We can put him right in the love of God. We can open his eyes. But we can recognize the, the wrong. It doesn't say we don't recognize that, but we mustn't judge him. Then later at the Last Supper, another one of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, chosen by Christ, and I suppose there'll be those who would say, well, it was ordained of God. I don't know that. I couldn't tell you that. I wonder whether it was possible for any one of them to have done what Judas did. I'm not going to judge Judas anyway. That's God's business. But I know what the scripture says, positively. Jesus said this night, one of you will betray me. And it says that he became very sorrowful. The Lord is very sorrowful when his children are deceived and are used by the evil one. Just pawns in the awful game. And Christ was sorrowful. He says, one's going to betray me. He knew it had to be. And when they asked, he says, the one that I give the sop. And in both accounts that I read, it says that when Christ gave Judas the sop, the Bible says, and Satan entered into him. What a statement. Satan entered into him. He was not his own from that moment. And then Jesus spoke. He said, what thou doest, do quickly. I wonder whether he spoke to Judas. And I don't think he did. I think, I believe that Christ saw right past the flesh and blood of Judas. And he saw his enemy, his adversary was right there at the breaking of bread, and he'd entered into Judas. And I believe Christ saw it, and he says, go on, what you're going to do, do quickly. For Christ was in control. And I believe he said to the devil, go on and do your worst. Do it quickly. We mustn't judge our brother, whatever they do. We can judge the thing that's wrong. The Bible tells us what's wrong. But we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Never forget that. There are many incidents, many things in Scripture that teach us this truth. When the first martyr of the church in the Acts of the Apostles, when he preached to the Jews and told them the truth that they crucified the Christ, Stephen, they stoned him to death. And as he was dying, he looked up into heaven and he saw Christ on the right hand of God. And his prayer was this. Lay not this sin to their charge. It's not them that's doing it, Father. It's Satan. I have that light. Lay not this sin to their charge. Stephen, in the moment of revelation, at the crisis point of his martyrdom, when he had a light of heaven upon him, and he was almost ready to be transferred to glory, he had the mind of God. He says, lay not this sin to their charge. Love your enemies. 
they're children of God, albeit fallen, albeit blind, captured by the devil, and he'll take them to hell, pray for them. It's not easy. Because we are subject to his influence too. As soon as we are hurt, as soon as our pride is touched, as soon as we begin to get self-pity in our hearts, as soon as we lose sight of our enemy, the devil, and somebody does the most despicable things to us, I've heard of some of the saints in this world, even in our very day, who under an atheistic regime have been put in prison and suffered the most degrading treatment to dehumanize them, treat them as less than animals, crowding them so much in the cells that when they wanted to relieve themselves, they were forced to let the excretia fall upon the faces and bodies of their other prisoners. Working on just a small bowl of watery soup, because it costs money to feed, and then flogged and made to work until they die, so they're laboring for nothing. Using people who were once who are the children of God, using them just for their own ends without thought for them at all. It's not those who do that that we fight. Our reward is in heaven. We're sure of eternal life. They're still in darkness. Their fate is far worse than ours. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Love your enemies. When Jesus came to the, I'm not sure whether it was the greatest trial of his life, Gethsemane was where the battle was won, I think, when he prayed and even wanted this tremendous responsibility, this thing he had to do to go to the cross. He even asked God, he said, all things are possible. If you can possibly take this cup from me. But he says, not my will, thy will be done. It was a battle, my friend. Because he was still in a human form and he was still God. When they nailed him to the cross, I believe he'd won the battle. You know, you win your battles before you enter them. I know that from natural experience in the last war. And any soldier would tell you the same. You've got to make up your mind before you come under the pressure what you're going to do. And if you're going to die for your cause, then you'll do it if you've made up your mind beforehand. But if you haven't, if you've not made up your mind, it's very easy to surrender. And even if you've made up your mind, you've got a really mean business to go through with it, especially when you're under tremendous pressure. And Jesus on the cross, I believe he, he made up his mind, of course. He won the battle in prayer to God. When he hung upon the cross, and all they did it the very worst they could to him. And in his weakest point, weak in body, mind and spirit, tired and weary, wounded and lost blood, dying naked upon the cross. Not easy then. But you know what he prayed? He saw the Pharisees, he saw the high priest, he saw them mocking him, he saw them chiding him, he saw them tempting him, he heard them, come down from the cross, if you be God. And even the thieves threw it in his teeth. And all his disciples had forsaken him. And what did he pray? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They're tools in the hands of the devil. It's not against flesh and blood. I'm dying on the cross. It's against the principalities and powers. The rulers of the darkness of this world. Jesus did not become vindictive. Jesus did not ask revenge upon those who crucified him. Jesus said, forgive them. They know not what they do. And later on, the Bible declares through the inspiration that God gave Paul. It says that when Jesus died upon the cross, he spoiled principalities and powers. When you win a battle... 
you don't only win and defeat your enemy, but you spoil them. You take everything they've got. You take the gold, you take the silver, you take the land, you take the taxes, you take the wealth, you take everything. They become your servants. And it says in the Bible later on, after he'd risen from the dead, and he says, all power is given unto me. The apostle writes, when Christ died on the cross, he spoiled principalities and powers. He took Satan in his weakest possible point in the flesh. He took Satan with all his power in the spirit, with no hindrance of the flesh. He took all of Satan and he spoiled him on the cross and made an open show of him triumphing in it the cross was not a disgrace the cross was not an act of a weak man the cross was the strongest thing that a man has ever done on the earth and only God could do it he defeated all the powers and the principalities and Satan himself he actually defeated them and spoiled them and took away every bit of his power and every bit of his dominion and he made an open show of it and triumphed over them in it, and rose from the dead, and he's on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he will bring revenge, and he will judge, and oh, pray for those, that will come under the fierce wrath of God, pray for those, who are blinded, and gripped by devilish forces, uncontrollable lusts, and desires, and the things that cause, all the problems in the world, pray for them, there's two terrible things going to happen. They're going to stand before the judge of the earth. That's a terrible thing to do. And then they're going to be lost forever in hell. Tormented day and night, for a spirit never dies. If you and I suffer a little bit of anguish in this life, sorrow in this life, frustrations of the spirit in this life, what is it going to be where there's no hope forever? Pray for those who despitefully use you. Our suffering is but for a moment, and our crown is forever and eternal life. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. I preached it this morning. I believe it. Yet unless you pray for me, I am no match for Satan. Pray for me that I may be filled with the great Christ. And I'll pray for you that you'll be filled with the great Christ. And let Sharon never go the way of all flesh. It's but an insignificant little place. But it's a big place too. It's doing a little witness, but it's done a great witness too. And pray that our vile, vicious unscrupulous enemy will not be able to divide us from one another you'll never do it unless you spend time with God and unless you dedicate your life every day but eternal issues are at stake if this church fails it'll be a great trophy in the hands of Satan it's known in this area it's known all over Britain it's known abroad and I tell you if anything happens in this church We've got a terrible account before God one day. And there's one person and one power with hosts under him that will do everything possible to bring that about. We've no time for judging each other. We've no time to hate. We must love. We must be filled with God. And we must live holy lives. Rejoice. Be glad. Feel the wonder of God and sing a chorus and dance. But also be sober, be diligent. Your enemy is like a roaring lion going about seeing whom he can devour. Never forget that. A soldier armed and all his weapons and stands ready to resist the enemy, he's got a chance. He'll probably win if he's got that spirit within him. Battles are won not by arms, but by the spirit of the people. But if he's a bit light and off his guard in real battle, he's in trouble. Put on the old armor of God. The scripture says, in the text that I use, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He says, put on the whole armor of God. The helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness. 
loins gird up with truth, gospel of peace, the shield of faith, which is able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And when you've done all, stand! And then when you've done that, stand. We're not going to retreat. We're going to advance. We're not going to hate our brother or judge our brother or our enemies. We're going to love. For love is of God. It's easier when you understand who you're fighting. We don't have to love the devil. We can hate him with all our heart, as God hates him. But it's better to love your enemies and let God do the work against the powers of darkness. I hope that we'll realize that prayer is absolutely vital. And we are wasting our time unless we're willing to pray. Never mind what you feel like. Never mind whether you can pray or not. Spend time with God. This morning I had to ask God very, very diligently whether this was the message or one on prayer. Because as I spent time with God this morning in prayer, I felt such a sweet presence of God. And God spoke to me in so many different ways, I thought I could pass that on to the people. Prayer is so vital. But I think perhaps I've got the right priority. When we know our enemy, that will drive us to prayer. May God bless you.